Welcome to Adventures in Grace. This is Jim Hockaday looking forward to another short video that just shares with you the wonderful truths of God becoming a part of everything you do in your life. The grace of God not only saves us, but thank God the grace of God is there to perfect us as we learn to live just like Jesus. Well, we want to always encourage you to let God come off the pages of your Bible, get into your life. Number two, allow the awareness of God to make it so easy for you to get answers to your prayers. And number three, thank the Lord we can share testimonies with people, not just drown them in scriptures. I like the model that Jesus left us where we just become the scriptures as we share the testimonies of what God's done for us. Had a wonderful time in Billings, uh, Montana. Pastor Shaw McFarland, his wife Heidi and family, wonderful, wonderful people. Man, Pastor Sean is doing a, just a bang-up job. He is doing such a good job. So I'll just share with you a great story right away, um, a testimony here. Uh, so we're in the service, and I'm teaching the first night on, you know, the difference between uh, the yes, yes, and the no, no. In other words, the first no is that you don't do everything that the Lord says over in Deuteronomy chapter 28, which means it would be sin. The second no, which would be as a result of sin, you become cursed. That's what Deuteronomy 28 tells us. If you don't hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and do all the commandments that I've shared with you today, then all these curses will come upon you. See, it has to do with the law being under the compulsion of having to do everything perfect. And if you miss one thing, then you get cursed. And then the yes and the yes is you have to obey and be obedient to every single thing he said to do. So you have to do it right in order to get right. Well, Jesus became our sin. He was cursed with our curse. He then fulfilled the law with righteousness so that we then are accounted as though we have fulfilled the law perfectly so that we can walk 100% in the blessing of God. And we were sharing this. I could tell there are a few people that were kind of questioning what I was saying, maybe because it went back against all their religion, you know, to take them back to all the works and stuff that we have to do. People have a hard time looking at somebody that actually has missed it and done wrong and then thinking that you shouldn't tell them, address it, let them know how bad they are and that they need to get their act together and get, get going because that's the way the world has actually helped every human being pretty much to live, which is, uh, Sonny, you've done really well. Come over here and get my hug today. Now you've done bad, so go to your room. You're going to get spanked. Well, it's the law, see, and we're, we're, we're conditioned that way. So I said, is anybody having problems with this? And the guy raised his hand and he said, yeah, you know, he said, what about all the sin that people do? And he said, they'll lose their salvation. And he said, and the repentance that they need. And I said, actually, that's an amazing word, repentance. I said, because for the last 11 years, the number one word in my life is repentance. He said, wow, brother Jim, that's because you're just so, so bad. Well, it's not about that as much as it is about as you walk with the Lord, you're going to see things from his perspective that you didn't see before. You're going to hear things that he's going to show you, and you're going to realize, oh my goodness, I've done it wrong forever. And of course, obviously, when you miss it, you have the opportunity to do what? To then see where you missed it, make the correction, and change the direction. And that's what repentance is. It's seeing where you're wrong and making a change of direction. And that's something that I do all the time. Because as you grow and as you develop with God, it will most likely be the number one word in your life. You're constantly repenting or changing direction and moving more toward the way God does and the way God sees. And therefore, you begin to have testimony after testimony of God's love and wonderful grace and kindness. Well, every week we come to you and share this invitation of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is simply Matthew eleven twenty-seven 27 to 30 in the Message Bible that says, now Jesus resumed talking to the people, but yet tenderly. The Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father and son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the Son the way the Father does, nor the Father the way the Son does, but I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. 
I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting upon you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. What an amazing invitation. And I don't know why I didn't finish my story, the grace story there, but we were sharing all about those wonderful truths of who, what Jesus has done for us. This man talked about repentance. I shared with him, yes, you know, repentance is an amazing word. And then he went over and started going to Revelation, saying, well, God's going to blot your name out of the book of life. And, uh, you know, people can lose their salvation, inferring that maybe I'm making it too easy for people to experience God. And so I said, well, um, that's a subject we don't have to talk about. People debate on that all the time. I said, but as far as the blotting out of the names, I said, just very simply, God has reconciled the whole world, which means through the blood of Jesus, he's removed all sin from every human being, past, present, and future, and brought a reconciliation, which is an accounting term where he leveled everyone's account in the mind of God. So for an individual to not accept the wonderful blessing of eternal salvation in Christ is to blot the name out. To accept it is for God to come and then indwell the individual so that they experience the wonderful victory that Jesus actually already secured for them at the cross, at the death, at the burial, at the resurrection, and at the ascension of Almighty God on high. Wow! Wonderful truth. You say, well, what's the grace story in that? Well, as soon as the miracles and healing started, the first three or four of them were right next to this guy. <laughs> He's watching people's eyes light up going, oh my goodness. One lady starts running and, and jumping and she says, I haven't felt this good in so many years. And she's running another lap and the place is just going crazy and loving God and just enjoying the moment. And look at how the Lord would love on him to just bring him into the goodness of God. I shared with him one thing. I said, you know, the gospel message that you might be struggling with, it really is the too good to be true good news. And God went ahead and did all those amazing things right in front of him just to bring him in. Well, we've been talking about starting this kind of new series about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just very simply, what it means is introduced into humanity was good and evil. It was only supposed to be the goodness of God. Man walk forever, live out of the tree of life, and never have to ever go to the knowledge and experience of the evil. Something we'll actually live with forever and ever in eternity as we live with the Lord in the book of Revelations. Aren't you thankful for the end? Amen. But in the meantime, God actually wants us to revisit the life that he really wanted us to have, not the life that Adam gave us through sin, and then the mind became distorted and everything became distorted. The devil certainly got in there and tried to get man off into an area where he would become uh, non-effective with God. And then he would feel real good patting himself on the back about all the things that he could do, but God wasn't involved. And that's the life that's actually going on right now. So we're endeavoring to share some things, and the first thing I'll share is grace needs an open heart and an open mind. God's grace is there to help you, not only to save you, but to, uh, to help you experience his goodness all through life. I like to say it this way, he perfects that which concerns him, and what concerns him the most is you. And by the grace of God, he wants to perfect your life. I know you're trying to do that. And we've learned that as we've grown up to try to be a better person and try to do better things and stop doing the, the wrong things, you know. That's Romans chapter 7, Paul under the law. But it's God that actually wants to do the perfecting. And I love that about the Lord, that his grace is there to help us in every single thing we do. But there's certain mentalities and certain ways that we need to see things according to the way that God sees things that will help us to experience that grace. I don't want to live my life without the grace of God. It's the grace of God that will perfect me. It's the grace of God that will eliminate any habit, any bondage, any wrong thought, any, any virus, any bacteria, any disease, any sickness. It is the grace of God that will perfect the love of God within my own heart that will cause my marriage to be amazing, my family to be amazing, my heart to see things right concerning other people and the way God sees them, to be a lover of mankind, and so on and so forth. Folks, we can't do this on our own. And the fact that we tried for so long is the real misnomer about all of this. That's where religion gets in. Let's just enjoy uh, the wide open spaces of God like that invitation talks about. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. So the first thing I want to share with you here today is about the attitude of the mind and the heart. Because God needs an open mind and an open heart. 
You know, uh, it's so easy while we're in this world traveling through it, you know, in the world, not of it, to become a whole lot more of it than we know. And that's the part where we develop mindsets, attitudes that are not uh, copacetic, you could say. They're not, they're not helpful. They don't work with God. So I want to address this over in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 and 12. It says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. Yes, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Thank God, by the word of their testimony. Yes. But what made the word of their testimony and the blood of the Lamb actually work in their life was, is the last part where they did not love their lives unto death. In other words, what does that speak of? But what Brother Hagen said in 2003, sitting there on a chair in Winter Bible Seminar, he said, this generation knows little or nothing at all about dedication and consecration. And it's the consecration of those that have gone before us that have been so spot on that actually produce the results in their life because it's the consecration to the principle that God is all you need and you love not your life unto death, which means you'll put yourself, A.W. Tozier, you put yourself on purpose in a position where you can't go back, which is what real faith is. He went on to say pseudo-faith is where you have a way out just in case God fails you. Come on, put those thoughts together and and. I trust you, you've you never had an experience like that. But for the most part, every single human being, especially every single Christian, has had an experience where, where they've had a way out just in case God failed them. And they didn't put themselves on purpose in a position where they couldn't go back. They always had a way back. And this is what we need to do. We need to come to terms with the attitude of our heart, the way that we see things, because that will affect greatly the way that we walk in faith and the way that God is able to actually intervene in our lives. The way you do life is the way you'll do faith. And if your faith isn't working, it goes back to the way you do life. You say, what does it mean to do life? It means your perspective. How do I know what my perspective is? Just look at the choices you make, which which you make choices concerning the reality you be, you believe to be real. So you've got a pain in your side and you run immediately to the doctor. So the reality that you believe is, is the pain is real and you need man to help you to get rid of the pain. But Jesus said he took all your pains. You could have run right to God and said, Lord, I don't know how in the world I could give this any time or any value in the course of my day that there's a pain in my side because Jesus took all my pains. He was pierced in his side that I might be free from my side. We were just in a meeting at Redeeming Love Christian Center, and all of a sudden, I called out. I said, someone on the right side on your back. Well, Pastor Adam Fredericks, he was up in, we, you know, he's pastoring right there at Newtown, Connecticut, where we're going to be going again in March to do another prayer conference with uh, Reverend Annie Durant and Kevin Durant, and then uh, Leanne Sosby, and of course, Jerry, her husband. And yes, of course, Aaron will be with me as well. We have a wonderful time together. Well, uh, he's there going, well, I got a pain on this right side, but not necessarily in the back. And then I said, well, actually, it's right there on the side. And he's like, oh, my goodness, he just called me out. He came up for three or four months. He's been hurting. And just like that, instantaneously, that thing disappeared. That is the grace and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, another grace testimony. But see, everything comes down to your perspective. And these people in the, in the word, they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, for they loved not their life unto death. Then we go on, it says in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother in the sense of indifference to or relative disregard for them in comparison with his attitude toward God. I like how the Amplified shares that because it helps to say, no, you're not supposed to hate your mother and father. It just means in regard to your love for God first, you are willing to put him first and your mother and father second. So you have to be willing to go with God, even if a parent were to say, I want you to go with me. You'd have to say, no, I can't do it that way, mom, because that's not the way that Jesus would have me do this. No disrespect to you. I love you, but I've got to love Jesus more. Now, notice what he's trying to say. He's trying to help us have the right attitude. And likewise, his wife and children and brothers and sisters and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple unless he has this, what? Dedication and consecration. Notice he said parents, he said wife, he said brothers, sisters, children. And then he even said yourself, 
which means in regard to your love for God, you have to put yourself at the bottom of the list. You say, wow, you know, I have to basically kill myself in order to love Jesus. No, that's not what he's saying. He's telling you as we put other scriptures together, when you put him first, he will bring everything that's necessary and wonderful into your life. There's something about that kind of dedication that works with God because that's the absoluteness that will put God in a position where he can be God. He said, what do you mean he can be God? Isn't God always God? Well, he's always God to God. In other words, to himself, he never changes. And he'll never change to us, but we can make him change to us by hindering from being who he is. You say, okay, I didn't understand that. All right, let's make that a little more simple. Based on how you see God will be how others will see him. And just because you're not receiving your healing because you're in the way doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to receive your healing. This is where we have to learn that this type of absolute consecration lets God be all that he is in your life. And that's where you begin to see the tangibility of God and the answers to prayers where you're able to give these testimonies to others. I see that my time is already at 16 minutes, so we're going to stop right here and let you know you can always go to the Jim Hockaday Ministry Facebook page and follow us to get these videos, or go to our YouTube channel, which is Adventures in Grace. Subscribe so that you can get all of these. If you need to, go back to the beginning and start right there at the beginning. You're going to love them. It's going to all help point you toward, and I'm guaranteeing you that if you'll follow what we're talking about, you will have God experiences in your life. Go to jimhockaday.com. You'll find our website. And by all means, please, my one thing that I actually urge you to do, jhmi at jimhockaday.com. You'll find it on our website. That's our email. Email us with your grace stories. I want other people to hear what God's doing for you. It'll so bless them. Until next time, we'll see you at the next video. But man, let these things work in your lives. Get ready to experience the Lord.